Wherever you're listening in the world, it's a pleasure to welcome you to Israel Cast, the podcast powered by Jewish National Fund USA, your voice in Israel. I'm Stephen Shalowitz, first reminding you that for over 120 years, Jewish National Fund USA has been the premier philanthropic movement for the land and people of Israel. While best known for planting trees in Israel, JNF USA contributes to Israeli life in so many ways, including community development in the Negev and the Galilee, preservation of heritage sites, supporting people with disabilities, and connecting high school and college students to Israel. To learn more and to see how you can contribute, visit jnf.org. Once again, hope you got it, jnf.org. All right, as for this episode, I just finished reading Jonathan Shanzer's latest book, Gaza Conflict 2021, Hamas, Israel, and 11 Days of War. I can't urge you enough to pick up a copy of the book because it really provides valuable context to that conflict and really perspective on the dynamics of the entire region. And indeed, we're truly honored to have Jonathan as our guest on this episode of Israel Cast. Jonathan is Senior Vice President for Research at the Foundation for Defense of Democracies, or FDD for short, where he oversees the work of the organization's experts and scholars. He's also on the leadership team of FDD Center on Economic and Financial Power. Jonathan previously worked as a terrorism finance analyst at the U.S. Department of the Treasury, where he played an integral role in the designation of numerous terrorist financiers. He's also held previous think tank research positions at the Washington Institute for Near East Policy and the Middle East Forum. He's a prolific speaker, has penned countless articles, and has written three other important books on the region. We'll have links to all things Jonathan on the show notes page of this episode on our website, jnf.org slash Israelcast. But for now, we warmly welcome Jonathan Shanzer to the program, who joins us via Zoom. Jonathan, welcome to Israelcast. Thank you very much for having me. All right. Well, listen, first, congrats on the book, which I truly couldn't put down. I kind of felt like a kid in a candy store because there were so many topics in the book that you covered that I just am personally interested in. And when I first got the book, I actually thought it was going to be a a bit of a play by play of those 11 days of the conflict that each chapter would talk about. Um, what actually happened, maybe each one of the days, but actually each of the chapters is really a standalone on the forces, the currents, the trends that led to the conflict. And that's why I want folks really to pick up the book to better understand the Middle East. And so once again, thank you for certainly filling in a void on many of the subjects, at least for me. And I'm wondering if you can take us back in terms of how, why you decided to write the book and what was your method in compiling the book, Jonathan? Sure. Well, first of all, thanks again for having me. Really wonderful to be with you. Um, I um, I watched that conflict um, closer than any other conflict uh, out of the Middle East um, in uh, in my career, and I don't think it was necessarily a result of um, more intense interest. I think it was actually the result of the available technology. I was able to watch it on uh, my smart TV. So I was able to stream Israeli television to my living room. I was able to stream Palestinian television to my living room, uh, Emirati television. And of course I had my phone next to me at all times watching my Twitter feed. I was able to watch the American coverage um, here in the US, the cable news networks, et cetera. And I walked away after those 11 days of conflict between Israel and Hamas with the sense that um, Really, it almost felt like um, I was watching two different wars, one that was covered out of the Middle East and one that was covered out of the U.S. The gap was so huge. Um, You know, people talk about bias. I don't think that bias is the right word. People talk about fake news. I I don't think uh, that's ever truly helpful, but I don't think fake news covers it. It was about editorial choices that were made here in the United States, very thin almost vapid coverage of uh, the way that this conflict unfolded. It was far more complex, I think, than most of the networks would seed. In fact, most of the analysts that I follow on Twitter really missed a lot of the big stories. So when it was all said and done, uh, I took a weekend off. I slept. um, I needed it. And then, um, you know, I was sort of sitting around um, and, and kind of just still itching for a fight, so to speak. Um, It just didn't feel like it ended the way that it should have for me. And I felt like there was just so much more that the public needed to know. And so I I wrote the book, um, the first draft anyway, I wrote in eight days. 
uh, 120 pages. And I, you know, I told my wife and kids to leave me alone. Um, they were already a bit grumpy with me because of how all consuming the war had been for me before that. Um, but then when that was done, um, I had that rough chap, you know, um, the, that rough draft of 120 pages. Then I went to Israel. Um, I went there right at the beginning of the Delta wave, um, was somehow able to get in and get out um, with uh, minimal uh, complexity. And um, but while I was there, I was able to talk to a lot of senior officials, uh, got some terrific interviews, came back and worked on the edits. And the end result was a book that we put out through FDD. We, we self-published it. We went from ceasefire to bookshelf in 166 days which for me was a record. I don't know if it's a record in publishing, but um, I certainly felt tired when I was done, but I also felt like it was the book that needed to be written after the vast, just that chasm that I witnessed in the coverage uh, between here and the Middle East. You referenced the media just a moment ago. We can certainly have a whole conversation on that. We had Monty Friedman here several years ago, and we talk, who, who uh, you reference and you talk about in the book. So if we have time later on, I'd like to talk about the media. When it comes to writing the book, though, it's, I want to share with our listeners something that I told you. You are such a concise and clear writer. And for a topic that is so vast, you really distill things down in layman's terms and make it so easy and make the subject so digestible. So I'm not just saying this because you're at the other end of the Zoom call, but really congratulations for putting this book together and really in quite record time. And really, so thank you. And it really is very, very digestible. Each chapter, as I said, is a standalone. We could do a whole topic in a whole hour on each chapter, but I wanna hopscotch around through the book and touch on some of those factors which led to the war, highlight some of the rather astonishing facts, at least astonishing for me that you included in the book. And I first wanna talk about Hamas because you write about it and its rise to power. And we have a very global audience, Jonathan. So share with our listeners really the origins of Hamas. And I hope I'm not asking you to bite off a bit too much here, but if you can also, when you talk about Hamas, talk about this internal fighting between the Palestinian factions, Hamas and Fatah, because as you point out, that just does not get covered. And that really needs to be addressed and talked about. Yeah, absolutely. So I really, I, I, I wrote a whole book on, on exactly that. And it's a, a subject that's near and dear to my heart. We'll have um, you back, Jonathan, to talk just about that. How's okay, that? very good. Very good. Um, so yeah, the, the story of Hamas's birth begins in 1987. There's actually a, a car crash um, uh, where a truckload of Palestinians are returning home from work in Israel. They're, um, they collide with a um, uh, a, an IDF, an Israel Defense Force uh, vehicle, and the funerals turn into protests in the Gaza Strip, and the protests begin to spread across Gaza um, and into the West Bank. And within a few days, we're witnessing what is then known as the first intifada, the uh, organic uprising of the Palestinians expressing uh, nationalist sentiments. And they engage in nonviolent protests, but also violence as well. And Hamas emerges as a core leader of this movement. You have to remember that the PLO, the Palestine Liberation Organization, was at that point in exile in Tunisia. And so they uh, were watching sort of uh, the PLO was watching helplessly uh, because they were they were not able to be part of those protests. And Hamas really assumed a significant component of that. And so you began to watch the rise to power of this group. It's a splinter group of the Muslim Brotherhood not an organization, as I like to joke, it, that typically celebrates Hanukkah with Israel every year. Um, this is a deeply anti-Israel and oftentimes anti-Semitic organization. And so this splinter group embraces violence and begins to at least try to lead the Palestinians um, in this um, organic uprising. They, they try to assume control. Uh, Yasser Arafat, the uh, the head of the PLO, is watching from Tunisia. He's deeply frustrated that he can't be sort of at the center of things. This is the man, of course, that we all recall uh, used to walk around with fatigues and a uh, three day old scruff and a holster at his side, you know, purporting to liberate the uh, the, the the people, the Palestinian people. And he is um, he's he's desperate. And so, what does he do? He actually engages with the international community and launches what we now know as the Oslo peace process. Hamas is furious um, that this would be the case, that it feels like uh, Arafat is wresting control 
of uh, the Palestinian movement uh, from their hands, where they clearly are the leaders on the ground in the West Bank and the Gaza Strip. And so the um, peace process begins. Arafat is widely recognized as the leader of the Palestinian cause. And in fact, he is a, a awarded a proto-state, the Palestinian Authority in the early 1990s. And as he is welcomed back into the international community, as he's welcomed back into the West Bank and the Gaza Strip and the peace process takes hold, Hamas begins a different kind of violent campaign. And that's where we begin to see the suicide bombings and the other gruesome acts of violence that I think we're so accustomed to at this point when we hear the name Hamas, that's what we think of. But what is so, I think, interesting to me is that they were, of course, doing this to attack Israelis and to shed as much Jewish or Israeli blood as possible. But it was also an attempt to, to derail a political process to which they were uh, vehemently opposed. And so this is the story of Hamas throughout the 1990s. There was sort of a, a two front war that they're waging, one against Israel and the other against the legitimacy of the PLO led uh, peace process. And this is really, I think, the untold story of Hamas, um, that all politics are local, as they say, and people really miss the local politics component of this, which I think is still very much a core aspect of the conflict today. Yeah, and you, you talk in the book about how Hamas's raison d'etre is to destroy Israel. Correct. And, and it's, it's deeply anti-Semitic in its founding charter. And there is no doubt that it has left a, a trail of blood in its wake dating back to the late 1980s. Um, there is no doubt about that. It's received assistance from Iran and it's, I mean, it's perfected the art of suicide bombing, if you will. Um, so there's no doubt that it's a terrorist organization, but it is motivated um, by some of this um, this political animus that it holds towards the PLO. And we'll talk about Iran in just a moment. But of course, there is this huge gap between Hamas and Fatah, the late Arafat's wing of the party, which is run by Mahmoud Abbas right now. And you even point out in the book, Mahmoud Abbas can't step foot in Gaza. Correct. And, and, and that all basically tracks back to maybe we'll start in, in 2004. Arafat dies. Mm -hmm. um, and when he dies, uh, Mahmoud Abbas was sort of the heir apparent. Uh, he steps in, but he inherits a deeply divided Palestinian polity, if you will. Um, the second intifada had erupted in 2000. So a war was going on where uh, Hamas was uh, carrying out deadly suicide attacks, but also the Fatah party that, that you just mentioned, were they were also involved. Um, it was a rejection of that Oslo peace process that we just discussed. And so the war is raging, Arafat dies, Mahmoud Abbas takes over. And you have to remember this was at the sort of peak of the George W. Bush democracy agenda, where Bush sort of um, declared that the answer to all of our problems with regard to terrorism in the Middle East is, well, we just need to hold elections. So um, at his encouragement, the Palestinians hold those elections in 2006. Everybody's sure that the Fatah party, the PLO, is going to win. Um, all the polls said they would. They lose. Hamas wins. They earn the right to form a government. Nobody wants that, not the Israelis, not the United States, not the Palestinian Authority itself. And so there is a political standoff that ensues until 2007, at which point Hamas overtakes the Gaza Strip by force. It is a civil war that people still to this day don't talk about. Um, people love to talk about the Palestinian-Israeli conflict and they will, you know, they'll talk about it ad nauseum. But nobody talks about the fact that the Palestinians had a civil war in 2007. It was Hamas versus Fatah. That's actually the title of my, my uh, uh, book from 2008. Um, the war was brutal. People were thrown off of tall buildings to their death. They're shot in legs and arms to ensure permanent disabilities. And the hatred remains. But the fact is, is that Hamas stayed in control of the Gaza Strip and the PLO clung to power in the West Bank. And so today we have Hamasistan and West Bankistan. And Mahmoud Abbas can't go to Gaza. Hamas can't operate in the West Bank. We have basically two different Palestinian statelets, if you will, and Israel in between them. So when people talk about the two-state solution, it's really not grounded in reality. Right now, there is it looks more like a three-state solution, which of course is not much of a solution at all. 
Yeah, you talked about that at the end of the book, that that's the only viable way move forward, moving forward is a three-stage solution. I had never heard of that. And just to build on that thread just for a second, is that even something that if, say, for example, Mahmoud Abbas said, you know what, Hamas, you know, we're going to just leave you out of this equation. We're going to establish our own entity here in the West Bank and you gegesunter hate, if you will. I mean, is that even a viability? It's the reality as we know it right now. I think aspirationally, we'd all still like to see a two-state solution. So the Palestinians have something that is unified politically, and we all kind of agree to it. But And and I actually get into this relatively early on in the book. The war itself was blamed on a real estate uh, controversy in eastern Jerusalem. What people don't realize was that elections were slated to take place that would have included Hamas and the PLO um, in April, right before the war. And... um, due to pressure from the United States and Israel and some of the pragmatic Arab states, the Palestinian Authority reneged on these elections. Hamas was not allowed to participate. They were furious. They thought that maybe this would be the moment that they would be able to kind of reconcile with their past and and become part of the political fabric of the Palestinians um, and perhaps become part of some unified um, Palestinian polity. It didn't work that way. Abbas, I think, by the way, wisely relented to the pressure of Israel and the United States. It would have been a disaster for a recognized terrorist organization to play a role, let alone a leading role, in a a future Palestinian government. So Hamas was uh, relegated to the sidelines again. Mm -hmm. And it was at that point, I believe, um, that Hamas realized, well, if we can't win by way of politics, well, maybe we need to go back to what's tried and true, which is war, violence. And I believe that is really what um, launched the conflict this time around. It was Hamas's attempt to win, to win the hearts and minds of the Palestinian people. When they couldn't do it at the ballot box, they did it by other means and other means for them as rockets and bombings and other acts of violence. Yeah, I'm glad you brought that up, Jonathan, because I wanted to go there is that what was really the catalyst for this latest conflict that you write about in the book, and it was indeed those elections, and there were always other pretexts that people like to give, like the Sheikh Jarrah neighborhood, for example. And can you just talk just a little bit about that? Sure. I mean, I have to say that was the biggest um, kind of red flag for me early on that the coverage- Yeah, because when I was watching the media, I thought this, this, has, this is apples and oranges. Yeah, correct. And and honestly, I mean, as soon as I saw this story emerge, um, I said, okay, we're we're in for it here. It's gonna it's gonna be one of those wars. Um, this was, of course, the and, fourth- and Jonathan's going to have something to write about. That's right. That's right. I mean, this is the fourth Gaza war, and you know, oftentimes, you know, we sort of, you know, they, they look at the one thing. I, I called it the single spark. Um, we've seen it before. Even the 1929 riots, um, you know, one of the first acts of violence against uh, or between Arabs and Jews, really, it was an act of violence by Palestinians against Jews. Um, it was blamed on Jews bringing religious artifacts, articles down to the Western Wall compound. And they were purportedly trying to Judaize the Western Wall. And at that point, there was a coordinated act of violence, a riot, basically, if you will, lynch against Jews at that time. Fast forward to 2000, the second intifada when that erupts, it was blamed on Ariel Sharon. Uh, he was then in the opposition, not not yet the, the prime minister of Israel, but he walks on the Temple Mount, and that was purportedly the moment where you know the match was thrown on the gasoline. Um, the media loves to do this, where they point to one single moment. In my view, that's what happened here with Sheikh Jarrah. This is a neighborhood um, in eastern Jerusalem. It's actually near the Damascus Gate, for those familiar with the old city, near the American Colony Hotel, which, by the way, is one of the most beautiful hotels in uh, in Jerusalem. And um, and so there was this um, there were a couple of homes that in the early part of the 20th century were owned by Jews. They had bought the 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 territory and they built homes. And it was theirs until 1948, 1949. Then the, the, the War of Independence erupts. Israel loses that territory to Jordan. And Jordan from 1949 until 1967 occupies this area. Jews are not allowed to live there. They've been expelled. Then after Israel reconquers the territory in 1967, the Jews want to return, but they don't evict the Arab residents. They take them to court. And this court case 
is like it's been going on for decades. And it, there was about to be a ruling just before the war erupted. And that was, according to the journalists and a lot of the analysts at the time, that it was this court case in Israel's very legitimate legal system that was the reason for the war. And ju just to be clear, real estate conflicts don't cause wars. Guns cause wars. Rockets cause wars. Missiles cause wars, right? That's what leads to war. And in this case, Hamas fired the first rounds and they, from 50 miles away in Gaza, that's how far Jerusalem is from the Gaza Strip, they decided that they wanted to intervene on behalf of the Palestinian cause. So they used it as an excuse. Again, I think because they wanted to reclaim the sort of popular support of the Palestinians after losing the opportunity to take part in elections, I think they used the Sheikh Jarrah controversy to try to um, insert themselves, which they did um, in this conflict. Yeah, Jonathan, at one point in the book, you said a war starts when the first bullet is shot. I think that was some, it was a quote, something like that. And so, indeed, you don't need a pretext. It's when that first bullet comes out of the gun. Let's then talk a little bit about the war and then some of the overarching trends and themes that also our listeners should be aware of, as you articulated so beautifully in the book. And one of the highlights of the war, or at least one that got a lot of attention, was the bombing of the al Jala Tower. And I'd love you to talk about that. We just referenced Mati Friedman, and you talked about him and his comments and how he weighed in uh, after that, that tower was bombed. So for our listeners' sake, just uh, provide perspective on that incident. Sure. So th this was roughly the middle of that 11-day conflict. And um, the, um, the, the images that I saw on uh, the TV screens, particularly here in the United States, um, was this building um, in the heart of Gaza, um, basically collapsing, imploding. And it was, it was run on repeat. And it was largely pointed to as some sort of outrage, um, a war crime, if you will, um, that Israel had perpetrated. And um, the story behind it was so much more complex than just Israel deciding to bomb a building, which I think is the way that it was widely described. Like, oh, look at, you know, the stronger Goliath beating up on David and destroying a, mass, a massive building. Um, but the story was that Israel had identified a problem, um, that there was a threat coming out of this building. And we weren't aware of it at the time, what it was. Um, but Israel, in, in the way that it always fights wars, um, decided that it was going to evacuate the area. It was going to, um, first it called the owner uh, or the owners of the building. Um, and the um, owners went floor to floor telling people to get out. Mm -hmm. uh, the Israelis also called um, every cell phone that they could identify. They've got this remarkable technology where if you know they can identify a cell phone within the building, if it's turned on, they call it. And in Arabic, um, someone says, get out, you know, the building is going to be destroyed. So everyone inside was warned. Then on top of that, they dropped what um, is commonly referred to as a knock-knock bomb on the roof, which is a um, low impact explosive. It doesn't destroy anything, but it's a pretty stark warning of what is about to come, kind of shakes the building, lets everybody know. So the building is removed, uh, is uh, evacuated. And then 15 minutes later, the Israelis destroy the building. Remarkably, it sort of implodes inward, um, I think, to, to kind of minimize the destruction in the surrounding areas. Um, but what is immediately pointed to in the coverage here was that it was a building that uh, housed the Associated Press and Al Jazeera. And so not only is it described as a war crime, but then it's described as an effort by Israel to um, block coverage, to quash media coverage of this war. And so the Israelis look like they're interfering in free press. Um, you know, uh, American international outlets are, are you know, are being, um, you know, they're, 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 they're being blocked from covering this uh, important war. So it turns out that a, a couple of things, you know, important lessons from this. Number one, the Israelis had evidence that there was a Hamas office inside the building, inside the Jala Tower, there was, and admittedly, I, I don't expect that people should have known that Hamas was there. It's not like it said, like, floor three, Hamas <laughs> office, right? Um, it, you know, they were probably uh, operating out of there in secret, right? But what they were doing is they had technology that was attempting to jam Iron Dome, 
Iron Dome, of course, is that remarkable technology that has shot down thousands of rockets midair that have been hurtling out of Gaza into Israel. It saved countless lives. So the Israelis felt that they needed to destroy the building because they weren't going to put boots on the ground. Um, that was number one. And apparently this evidence was shared with the Biden administration and they accepted it as um, they, they accepted its veracity. And, and so all of the complaints coming out of AP and Al Jazeera, I think, are moot now. But at the time, wow, you wouldn't believe how Israel was excoriated uh, on Twitter and in the press. It was, it was truly remarkable. But then there is another, I, I think, a couple of other things to point out. One is that AP, and you mentioned Mati Friedman, has a little bit of a history of turning a blind eye to Hamas activities in or around their offices. And this is something that Mati Friedman published in The Atlantic several years ago, saying that he was aware of uh, Hamas activities and that the editorial leadership, the owners of AP, didn't want to acknowledge that this was the case for fear of angering their Hamas hosts hmm. in the Gaza Strip. You gotta remember Hamas is a terrorist organization. They're not like, oh, you know, go ahead and report whatever you want. And it's actually, I think, really important to note that during these wars, we never see any footage of Hamas militants firing rockets. People are simply not allowed to cover it. Um, so it always looks like Israel is the one that's the aggressor and Hamas is just simply, or Gaza is simply absorbing all of this, um, you know, uh, all, all this rocket fire from Israel. And, you know, th there is, I think, something to be said about the way in which these wars are covered and how AP has been complicit in the unspoken rules of the game. Um, the last thing that I'll just note is Al Jazeera had a building there uh, or had an office in the building. Al Jazeera is a deeply complicated media organization. It's owned by the government of Qatar and the government of Qatar is a state sponsor of Hamas. So, uh, it, and you really can't distinguish between Al Jazeera itself and the government. They are effectively one and the same. You don't ever see Al Jazeera criticizing Qatar in any way, right? I mean, it is a state outlet. And in the past, the US government has actually targeted, the US military has targeted Al Jazeera because uh, of offices that were deemed to be complicit in terrorist activity. Al Jazeera reporters in Afghanistan and Iraq somehow always know where to be minutes before a gruesome attack took place against US forces. Um, and so there is, I think, just a lot of complexity that went missing in all of this. And, and that, you know, there's one chapter that I devote to the Al Jala episode um, in my book. I probably could have written a book by itself on, on this mess and, and how much was unreported during that time. It's a good thing I don't have high blood pressure, actually, Jonathan, because if I did, I would just be downing every pill in that bottle, especially when I read that chapter, because I mean, my mind was actually blown no pun intended, when, when I read that. Um, because indeed, I, I do hope that you actually continue writing about that incident because again, it's very, very complex. You just talked about the rockets and I wanna go there and then I wanna talk about the tunnels, okay? Or the Hamas Metro, as you call it, um, or as it's called. And you wrote here in the book, by the end of the conflict, roughly 3,400 rockets, around 78% of the 4,350 total were fired into Israeli territory. Another 680 rockets, about 15.5% exploded or landed in the Gaza Strip and 280 or 6.5% fell into the Mediterranean Sea. One assessment suggests that 91 Palestinians were killed by errant rockets that fell in Gaza, amounting to a significant percentage of the Palestinian death toll. I want you to weigh in on those rockets because of for, uh, from a couple of angles. The first is, where did the rockets come from? Okay, you pointed out in the book, I want you to share it with our listeners. What are the future of the rockets? Because as you also point out, is that Hamas is getting more technologically savvy with the types of weaponry that they're developing right now. So Israel has to be cautious about that. And for all the rockets that did not go off, where are they now? Okay. Um a good meaty question. Um, so first of all, almost all of the rockets that Hamas has is thanks to Iran. 
And Iran, of course, is the world's foremost state sponsor of terrorism, dedicated to the destruction of the state of Israel, the sponsor of Hezbollah, Palestinian Islamic Jihad, and a, a range of other um, terrorist groups. Um, and, and really, the idea is to sort of draw a cordon around Israel to have you know terrorist groups on every border. Um, and they're working on it. Um, certainly, they've got Gaza, they've got Lebanon, and they've got Syria as well right now. Um, they just don't have Jordan, but they've got elements within the West Bank. Um, you know, it's it's very dangerous what uh, Iran is trying to do. What they've done over the years is they've trained um, people ha- how to build rockets, how to fire rockets, um, to smuggle rockets. Um, it used to be that you know you would see full rockets being smuggled in by way of Sudan and then Egypt and then the Sinai Peninsula. Since uh, the rise of Abdel Fattah al Sisi uh, in Egypt, uh, this is the Egyptian strongman that overturned the Muslim Brotherhood victory there. Um, He's actually done a pretty good job of cutting down on the smuggling of these full rockets, but we still see the smuggling in of rocket parts. Um, And again, you have Hamas um, engineers that have been trained to do this. And, you know, the way I would describe it is it's that old adage of, you know, give a man a fish and he's reliant upon you, teach a man how to fish and he can feed himself every day. Um, You know, Iran taught Hamas how to fish, so to speak. So, you know, there was there were moments during the war and I got into some arguments with some analysts on Twitter, people that I had respected. Um, and I was shocked to hear them say that there was really, um, you know, that this wasn't happening because of Iran. This wasn't a proxy battle. And my, my mind is blown. I'm thinking this is insane. You know, th- none of this would happen without Iranian training assistance, by the way, also the hundreds of millions of dollars that Iran has provided Hamas over the years to prepare for wars just like this one. And so it may not have been directed by Iran, but it's fingerprints were all over it, and it would not have happened were it not for Iran, the foremost sponsor of Hamas in the world. There are other uh, sponsors. I mentioned them in the book, Turkey, Qatar, and Malaysia, um, but none of them hold a candle to the kind of influence that Iran has. Now, the weapons themselves, um, they're unguided rockets, which means They don't know exactly where they're going to land when they fire them, Um, which, by the way, in and of itself is a war crime. Um, Just to be clear, when you don't know what you're firing at, you're firing at civilian populations in the hope of hitting something. That's a war crime. Um, And and so that's always been the Achilles heel of Hamas, that they just don't know where they're going to land. They don't have the accuracy. And it's been frustrating for them. They like to kill more Israelis if they can. Um, And so what happens is some of them land back in the Gaza Strip, and we saw evidence of that where Palestinians were killed by their own uh, because of errant rocket fire. Some landed in the Mediterranean where they were trying to fire them sort of north toward Ashkelon. They missed their mark. They went west and they went or left. And um, and and so they missed. But um, we see significant numbers of uh, of Palestinians killed at the hands of Hamas because they just don't have a good handle on the technology. And um, that's something that Iran is trying to change. Um, and, and you know, there are still, I mean, I think Hamas started with something like 15,000 rockets in its arsenal um, at the beginning of the May war. They fired roughly 4,000, let's just say they've got 10,000 left over, plenty more for another round of conflict. They're ready to roll if they need to, if they want to, if they decide that the timing is right. But in the meantime, the real concern that I voice, and there's a whole chapter, uh, I think it's chapter nine of the book uh, called Northern Exposure. I look at the experiment that uh, Iran is conducting right now with Hezbollah, which is to convert those unguided rockets, those we can call them dumb rockets, to convert them into smart rockets or guided rockets. And the idea is that With a $15,000 investment, you can take one of these dumb rockets and convert them. You put fins on them, uh, you put GPS on the cone, you drop in some software, some circuitry. uh, With the right engineering know-how, you can turn an unguided rocket into one that you can literally guide to within five or 10 yards of the intended target. And you could also potentially evade Iron Dome while doing it. So what that means is that you know, right now Hezbollah can do this. Hamas aspires to it, but the goal would be to evade Iron Dome and then to be able to hit the Dimona nuclear reactor, 
to be able to hit the chemical plant in Haifa, the Azraeli towers in Tel Aviv, the Kiria, the so-called Pentagon of, um, uh, of, of the IDF. These are the sorts of targets they love to hit if they could. And this is the concern. I think this is probably what's keeping Israeli war planners up at night these days is uh, what's known as the PGM challenge, precision guided munitions. I would just say for those keeping track at home, just remember PGMs, it will pop up in 2022, 2023. It's the future of the conflict and, and it's a, a, a rather daunting one at that. Jonathan, I don't have a question in particular about the Iron Dome. You talk about it, obviously, in the book. It plays an important role in every conflict that Israel has been having. Um, what should we know about it and really the importance of the Iron Dome, the future of the Iron Dome? Sure. So, I mean, this is um, a system that's been around for a little more than, I guess, 10 years now. And it's um, it's truly remarkable. It was um, invented out of necessity, really, the, when the Palestinians were... Uh, blocked from carrying out suicide bombings uh, when Israel built the barrier around the Gaza Strip and the majority of the West Bank, they didn't have the ability to continue to carry out those kinds of attacks. So they turned to the next best thing, which was um, for them, uh, these rockets. And um, so Israel realized that it had a, a real strategic problem because it couldn't have its people hiding in shelters day in and day out uh, while Hamas was able to do this. So they developed this technology. Um, it is a short range missile defense or rocket defense really. Um, and it is able to determine the trajectory of a rocket the moment that it's fired. And they track it to see how fast it's going, you know, um, the, how high it is up in the air, you know, and, and they begin to estimate when it will start to come down. So they, they kind of assess the arc. And based on that, um, they determine whether or not it's worth shooting it out of the air. In some cases, they allow the rocket to fall short into the Gaza Strip, as we discussed. Uh, in some cases, it will, you know, uh, it, it is bound toward uh, an area that is not populated. It'll go beyond some of the settlements on Israel's um, Gaza border, for example. And so they let it explode in the desert. But for those that appear to be destined uh, for civilian areas, um, or areas deemed to be of strategic importance to Israel, they fire them. Each interceptor costs somewhere between fifty and hundred thousand dollars. So this is not—we're not talking about small fries here. You know, the rockets themselves can cost a few hundred dollars for Hamas, but for Israel to decide to fire one is no small thing. It, it you know, a war like the one we just saw will cost hundreds of millions of dollars just in interceptors alone. But what is remarkable about the system is that it affords Israel the time and space to make decisions during the heat of battle that I don't think we really see anywhere else on the planet. Um, in other words, Israel's under like constant bombardment, as we just saw, 4,000 rockets over 10, 11 days. That is a huge amount of, uh, of projectiles hurtling into Israeli airspace at, at high speeds. And you don't see the Israelis lashing back out of anger. You see them calmly shooting them down and then determining what they want to strike in response. And it's that time and space, it's that calm that we see coming out of Israel that I think, I, I don't know if people truly acknowledge the miraculous nature of this defensive weapon. I believe that were it not for Iron Dome, A, you'd see probably hundreds, if not thousands of Israelis killed. But if that were to happen, then there would be calls from the Israeli public to put boots on the ground in the Gaza Strip. And you would see an escalation in war beyond anything that we've seen in the past. And we that's something that you want to avoid. And so its it's been truly a lifesaver. And what is actually truly sickening to me was when we saw members of Congress at the end of this most recent round, um, you know, people call them the squad. I would actually call them the Hamas caucus uh, in light of some of the things that they said, but they wanted to defund Israel's Iron Dome replenishment. And so the message coming from members of Congress is essentially, you know, this war wasn't bloody enough. We wanna see more Israelis die. And as a result, we wanna see more Palestinians die because we don't want the airspace to be defended. It was a truly sickening mm -hmm. statement coming from these members. And so um, I can't stress enough how important Iron Dome is to keeping things at a relatively low flame. 
And let's not forget, it's protecting Israeli Jews, but it's also protecting Israeli Arabs. Correct. Right, which is an important point. There's still a number of bases to cover. I want to talk about Iran, the war between wars, a little bit about Turkey, the Abraham Accords, but just real briefly, the tunnels. Because as I said at the top of the show, there were some facts that you featured in the book, which I simply did not know that were quite eye-popping for me. And um, when you talked about the tunnels, you wrote in the quote, uh, page 33, if anyone has the book and would like to follow along, in the aftermath of the Metro, quote unquote, operation, of course, you're meaning tunnels. In the aftermath of the Metro operation, the IDF reported that an estimated 300 to 400 Hamas operatives were were killed underground. The Israelis released video footage from the operation and announced that more than 60 miles, 60, 60 miles of tunnels were destroyed those 60 miles may have accounted for a mere 20% of the metro network. And when I read that, I knew the network was fairly vast. And I didn't study math in college. That's why I studied Chinese, because I'm horrid at math. But 20%, there there, there are a whole lot of other tunnels there, Jonathan. I think the tunnels, as far as I understand, are still, many of them are in operation. Many of them, by the way, are sneaking under, you know, homes, um, streets. School hospitals, schools, schools like you name it, right? Um, and so that, by the way, that's another war crime. I mean, that's the, the use oh. of human shields for, for you know, military infrastructure. Um, but, um, the, you know, the metro system was a massive diversion of humanitarian assistance, right? The amount, sheer amount of cement um, that should have gone to rebuilding Gaza after the last round of war in 2014 or the one before that in 2012 or the one before that in 2009, right? Um, it's clear that this was a multi-year effort costing hundreds of millions of dollars, almost certainly with Iranian assistance. And they created this um, very complex labyrinth. The goal was for uh, Iranian commandos to be able to pop out when Israelis put troops on the ground, to be able to pop up and kill or kidnap as many Israeli soldiers as possible. Israel was ready for it. Uh, They had good intelligence, as they often do. Not a surprise. Um, But what was so interesting was that um, you know, I think it was the second or third day of the war, the Israelis issued a tweet saying that they were putting boots on the ground. Um, And I actually remember um, rushing inside. I'd been outside um, taking a breather uh, on a nice spring day um, after watching, you know, whatever it was, like 14 hours of conflict on on television. I see the tweet. Okay, here we go. I got to go back in. And um, I'm watching and the, um, the reporters out of Israel are saying, no, I can't confirm this. It's not happening. Um, Not according to my sources and not, by the way, look behind me. This is the Gaza Strip right behind me. We don't see columns of, of, you know, of troops uh, pouring in. And um, as it turns out, the message was intended for Hamas and they flooded the tunnels with these commandos. And then the Israelis started bombing where they could, where it was safe to bomb. And um, they ended up knocking out, you know, that those 60 miles, but there was still a lot more left. They ended up taking out a lot of those commandos. What was so interesting to me, though, about this episode was that the um, the Western media, we talk about the media reporting and the discrepancy, the Western media was irate um, with the IDF spokesperson, who I guess had initially confirmed that there were troops going in. After an hour, apparently they went back and, and they adjusted that statement and said that um, that there were no troops on the ground. But by then, a huge number of media outlets here in the United States, serious places, right? Wall Street Journal, New York Times, AP, they all run the story that uh, Israel had invaded the Gaza Strip. And they believed that Israel had intentionally misled the media, hmm. um, that Israel had deliberately engaged in an information operation. But what was so amazing to me is that had they just turned on the TV in Israel, they would have seen that it was not the case. Yeah, it's journalism 101, isn't it? Yeah. I want to move on then to Iran right now. And indeed, we could have a whole conversation about Iran's relationship with Hamas. Can you address the fact that Hamas is labeled as a terrorist organization, yet Washington is engaging with Iran who is its chief broker. And there's this divide. And can you talk about that, that dynamic yeah. right there? Yeah. I mean, look at that. That was sort of the big warning. I think I issue n- near the end of the book, no. uh, which is that during the conflict, the U S was still pursuing a return to the nuclear deal with Iran. 
Um, Iran, of course, is the world's foremost state sponsor of terrorism, and it's on the cusp of going nuclear, which of course is a major concern for Israel. The U.S. is doing everything that it can to engage diplomatically so that a conflict is not necessary. Um, this has been the thing that's preoccupied our Middle Eastern policymakers dating back to 2010, 11, 12. Um, and this administration in particular is, um, is desperate to get a deal. They just don't want a conflict in the Middle East over the Iranian nuclear program. And so even as this war is raging, and even as we see Iran's fingerprints all over the uh, Gaza rockets and the metro system and all these things that we've talked about, um, the administration keeps pursuing Iran and trying to throw sanctions relief. Effectively, hundreds of millions of dollars or hundreds of billions, actually. Um, and the idea here is that, you know, the U.S. could find itself in this very awkward position where in the next round of conflict, if the U.S. successfully twists Iran's arm and gets them back into the deal, um, the U.S. could be actually funding both sides of the next Gaza war. In other words, we are unabashedly supporters of Israel. We provide Israel with $3.8 billion a year in military assistance. Much of it is actually spent here in the US, um, but it is nonetheless support, direct support for Israel. And then if we give this sanctions relief to Iran as part of the nuclear agreement, um, you know, maybe back when we first entered the interim nuclear deal in 2013, there were questions about whether that money would trickle down to terrorist groups like Hamas or Hezbollah. Today, it's, it's not really anything that needs to be tested any longer. I think the facts bear out. It shows that Hamas, Hezbollah, other groups benefited from this largesse from, from Iran after they got the windfall from the 2015 deal. So we could find ourselves in this really strange, almost Orwellian position where we're funding both sides of a war, where one side purports to be an American, or that we, we say is an American ally, and the other one is a terrorist group funded by an enemy of the United States that we're funding nonetheless. So you sort of can't make this stuff up. And I'm, you know, my, that chapter that I write, I think it's the penultimate chapter of the book where I kind of, it's, it's a warning to US policymakers. Don't, let's not go there. That is just really the worst thing that I could imagine for US policy in the Middle East. Well, speaking of US policy, of course, the US was behind the Abraham Accords. And you talk about it in the book that those accords really weathered this storm, this Gaza conflict. They did. And, you know, there was a moment or two early on where it didn't look good. I think the emotional aspect of watching, you know, Arabs uh, getting hit by a superior military power, even if Hamas started the war, Israel was clearly finishing it. And um, the video just didn't look good. And when I turned on, you know, uh, Al Arabiya, for example, which is based out of the UAE, um, you know, and I'm watching it, you could tell it just, it, it, it was not playing well. But it was also interesting that the um, leadership of these countries did not want to let the Gaza conflict hijack their new relationships with Israel. Um, they saw the strategic value of maintaining these alliances with Israel. I'm talking about the UAE, Bahrain, Sudan, Morocco. Of course, there's the Egyptians and the Jordanians as well that have peace dating back to uh, the 1970s and 1990s. Um, but there was, I think, a sense, even across some of the other Arab states that have not yet normalized with Israel, that, you know what, we're not going to have this on like endless repeat. Um, we're not going to see the sort of egregious video that is designed to whip up furor on the Arab street, just not seeing it. And, and so you just didn't see the large numbers of people pouring out the streets. Uh, it was actually really interesting. In some cases, there were hashtags saying Jerusalem is my cause. And then the governments themselves put out hashtags that countered it. Jerusalem is not my cause. And at the end of the day, I think the message was and continues to be, you know, the Palestinian issue is an emotive one. It is clearly still important to the people of the region. But that doesn't mean that it has to be the top priority. It doesn't mean that everything else needs to be subordinate to the Palestinian cause when they think about their national objectives, their regional goals, their foreign policy. And so the way that I would describe it is, is that um, the Abraham Accords relegated the Palestinian issue to perhaps third or fourth among their priorities, not number one. Mm 
and it made room for them to continue to pursue normalization with Israel. And so at the end of the, the conflict, at the end of those 11 days, the normalization agreements known as the Abraham Accords remained intact. And in fact, today, those relationships continue to grow and thrive and prosper. And that is, I think, a really good sign. It means that this was a stress test that they passed. And um, the hope is that we'll see them continue to grow. And perhaps other countries like Saudi Arabia or Oman or, I don't know, uh, Tunisia at some point, maybe join as well. Um, but, you know, I think we, we passed an important test here. Yeah, a stress test, especially during the honeymoon period. Correct. Right. Um, you talk also about the war between wars. You have a whole chapter on it, which I thought was absolutely fascinating. And you talk about how Netanyahu goes to Moscow, asks Putin to put pressure on Iran to stop their activities in Syria and the other adventures in the region. And I'm just wondering if you can really briefly share that dynamic and why Netanyahu would ask Putin and what would it even be in Putin's best interest? Like, why would Putin even bother to entertain that thought? So, I mean, first, it's, I think, important to note that the war between wars is a decision that the Israelis undertook under Netanyahu probably, I don't know, eight, nine years ago, that they were not going to just absorb um, strike after strike by Iranian proxy groups and not respond to Iran itself. Mm -hmm. And on top of that, that they weren't going to allow Iran to set up additional terrorist groups uh, to engage in other activity that could threaten Israel long term. Um, without paying a price, a steep price. And so we've seen Israelis, um, Israeli strikes against, um, you know, Iranian assets in Syria, which we'll talk about, but also, you know, targeting uh, Iranian nuclear scientists inside Iran, cyber attacks inside Iran, attacks on, you know, maritime vessels in the Persian Gulf or the Mediterranean, um, you name it, whatever Iran is up to, Israel is trying to make sure that they pay a price for any perceived or potential aggression against Israel, short, long-term, present, future. And so it's a, it's a war that's been going on. And, and, and what I sort of note in the book is that you cannot ignore the fact that this war was going on, that it is going on. And, and don't, you, can't, you can't leave it out of the discussion as to what prompted the conflict in May. The conflict in May was part of a matrix, if you will, um, of other smaller, lesser conflicts that have been raging across the region. And so I very much view the Gaza conflict of 2021 as part of that war between wars, that ongoing effort by Israel to sort of mow the lawn um, across the region. And so then that gets you to the, the sort of Russia component of this. So one of the things that um, Iran has been doing is it's been moving those PGMs. Remember, we talked about those precision guided munitions. They've been trying to smuggle them by way of Syria into Lebanon, which is where Hezbollah is active. And Hezbollah already has several dozen to several hundred PGMs, according to the best estimates that I've heard from senior Israeli officials. And Israel wants to halt that transfer as much as humanly possible. And so you, I'm, I'm sure you've seen it. Anybody that's opened up you know, the website of the Times of Israel or Jerusalem Post or any of the Israeli news sites, you'll see that there are things that are exploding in the middle of the night on a regular basis inside Syria. In some cases, pretty significant attacks, coordinated attacks by the IDF. Um, and so, um, but what makes all of that really interesting is that of course, you know, we had that red line a moment uh, in 2013 where Assad used chemical weapons against his own people. The Obama administration threatened to go in and, 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 and punish them for it, elected in the end not to. And after hemming and hawing for a year or so, um, it became clear that the Obama administration was not going to take control of the chaos in Syria. So enter Vladimir Putin, the strong man of Russia, who says, you're not going to do it. I'm going to take this. This is a, a, a contested territory. And, you know, Russia is a, is a let's not call it a superpower, but let's call it a significant world power. We're going to go in and we're going to restore order and we're going to assume leadership on the world stage. I, I you know, I, I want to maybe stress that Russia is not a leader in anything, but that was the goal. And um, so what that meant is that every time Israel goes into Syria now, to uh, take care of a threat, PGM or otherwise, they have to deal with a sovereign. And that sovereign is not Assad, it's Putin. 
And so there is this ongoing, very strange, delicate dance where the Israelis go to Russia. They go to Moscow, St. Petersburg. They meet with uh, leaders, um, Russian military leaders, political leaders, and they say, we're not asking, and we're not even asking nicely. We are going in to Syria because we have seen the following problems and we need to take care of them. And the Russians acquiesce time and again. And they do it because not because they they love that there's conflict going on inside you know an area that they control, but because they realize that this is Israel's national security at, at the end of the day. This is Israel's neighborhood, um, and so that that explains this very strange dynamic. So it's more of a question of Netanyahu or an Israeli leader going to Putin and saying we are going to do X, Y, and Z versus can you please help us out with. Yeah, and, and, and really the difference is so important for the Israelis. Asking for permission to strike um, is not in their DNA, right? Uh, you know, Israelis see it as their mandate to take care of their own security. Uh, so it's not an ask. It's not a pretty please. It's a, guys, you know, uh, you're there and we know that you're there. Um, we're not asking you as friends. We're not asking you as allies. In fact, we're not even asking you. We're just telling you that it's going to happen. So get the hell out of the way. And, and that's been the way that it's worked. It has imperiled some Russians and there have been some moments that have been hairier than others, um, but the Israelis have found a way to keep it going so that the war uh, between wars um, you know, continues to achieve the goals that Netanyahu and now Bennett have set out. Yeah, I appreciate your clarifying that distinction uh, because that was one question that I had there. Listen, we just have a couple of more minutes left. You've been so incredibly generous with your time and with your comments. Um, so I'll just make it two questions. First one is, there will be another conflict with Gaza. Look, unfortunately, I think so. And, and primarily because you have Iran that continues to be this sponsor and they could inherit a windfall as a result of the um, a return to the nuclear deal. Uh, but even if there isn't, they've still prioritized the funding of their proxies, including Iran, um, in terms of preparing for war against Israel. There's also Turkey, uh, Qatar, and Malaysia, which I mentioned earlier. These are lesser sponsors, but they are continuing to support Hamas on the world stage. As long as that happens, and by the way, all of these countries uh, not Iran, but the others are considered to be allies uh, at some level or another with the United States and with the West, um, it has to stop. Um, there needs to be more pressure until there's pressure, until Hamas truly feels isolated um, and beat up by the Israelis on, on, uh, on the battlefield. I don't believe that there is um, sufficient deterrent to prevent another war. So in other words, the dynamic has not changed one iota. It feels every time I watch one of these conflicts, again, you know, there've been four, um, it feels more like mowing the lawn um, mm -hmm. than it does a, you know, uh, a significant achievement on the battlefield for Israel or anyone else for that matter. You went into great detail in the book about Turkey's involvement and engagement with Hamas. And I really urge everybody to pick up a copy of the book, if for no other reason than to read that, because that was rather eye-opening for me. Listen, Jonathan, as we really wind down our conversation right now, because I know you got to head off into the sunset, Jewish National Fund USA has launched a year-long campaign. Don't know if you got the memo. It's called Conversations on Zionism, Reclaiming the Narrative. It's a year-long campaign to reclaim really the beauty, the inclusivity of Zionism, what Zionism is all about. Everyone with an earshot can go to youtube.com slash Zionism studios to catch really these important conversations. And so with that in mind, I'd love to hear what your definition of Zionism is and what Zionism means to you. Look, Zionism is uh, the Jewish people uh, asserting their right um, to live in the land of Israel and to build uh, a country, to build a culture, uh, to build a state. Um, that is Zionism in essence. Um, it's really not much more than that. It doesn't have to do with other peoples. It's not a, about anyone else. It's about the Jews and their struggle um, to reassert um, their lives in their ancestral homeland. And, um, you know, it's been a remarkable journey uh, for Israel for the last seven plus decades, if not, you know, several millennia. Um, but uh, I continue to watch and track the, the Jewish experiment in Israel with immense um, amazement um, at how much has been achieved. And um, I think there's really a lot to be proud of.
It's a great story, isn't it? It is. All right. Well, Jonathan Shanza, we're going to leave it right there. We truly want to thank you so much once again for joining us here on Israel Cast. Look forward to definitely having you back because we really only scratched the surface with your book once again, Gaza Conflict 2021. So congratulations once again on the book. And of course, we'll have a link to Jonathan and the book on the show notes page of our website, jnf.org slash Israel Cast. Again, please pick up the book, Gaza Conflict 2021, Hamas, Israel, and 11 Days of War. Pick it up, pick up a copy wherever you like to buy your books. And before we move on to housekeeping, I'd like to remind you, as we just said, that Jewish National Fund USA believes the time has come for us to reclaim the narrative, take ownership of the word Zionism, and show the world how beautiful, inclusive, inspirational Zionism really is. So join Jewish National Fund USA's conversations on Zionism, reclaiming the narrative, our year-long series, which will educate, engage, and inspire on the true meaning of the word Zionism and reclaim its true meaning in all its glory. Go to youtube.com slash Zionism Studios to catch all of those terrific conversations. And of course, we do release new episodes of Israel Cast every other Wednesday. And just so you never miss an episode, subscribe to us wherever you get your podcast. Simply search for Israel Cast. How easy is that? And don't forget to rate and review us to make it easier for more folks around the world to find us. Or you can always enjoy the show by visiting us at our website. Once again, it's jnf.org slash IsraelCast. Now it takes a homo shot to put IsraelCast together. And for that, we thank Vivian Grossman, Dara Shapiro, and J.D. Krebs. Our editors are Jay Rothman and James Casada from Miratone Studios right here in the very heart of New York City. And the music that you hear at the top and tail of the program is titled My Eden. It's by the very talented Rafi Malkiel from his album Water on the Tzadik label. Now, Israel Cast is indeed powered by Jewish National Fund USA, your voice in Israel. And for more info about JNF USA, do visit jnf.org. And if you'd like to write to us with story ideas or just to say howdy, we'd all love to hear from you. So email us at israelcast at jnf.org. Once again, israelcast at jnf.org. We'd love to hear from you. Meantime, I'm Stephen Shalowitz, thanking you for tuning in and looking forward to having you join us on future episodes of Israel Cast.